Well, in this world of instant everything, uh, everybody's familiar with instant coffee in little packets, instant tea in little bags, instant pudding, and even instant mashed potatoes now. But perhaps the, uh, the nicest thing of all is this recent innovation by the commercial banking company of Sydney. It's a little card that brings you instant cash. The beginning of ATMs in Australia. In this retrospect, we look back to the future as we focus on technology. Hello, I'm Donna Field. Welcome to Retrospect. As always, we pick a theme and trawl through the ABC's vast news and current affairs archives for stories and footage. Today, we're looking at technology. In 1974, science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, who helped write the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, visited the Qantas Computer Centre in Sydney. In this item, a journalist from the show Perspective asked the writer what the 21st century would hold for his own son. Well, with that movie 2001, you're projecting us into the 21st century. I brought along my son Jonathan, who in the year 2001 will be the same age as I am now. Maybe he will be better adjusted to this kind of world that you're trying to portray. The big difference when he grows up, in fact, when he wanted to wait for the year 2001, is that he will have in his own house, not a computer as big as this, but at least a console through which he can talk to his friendly local computer and get all the information he needs for his everyday life, like his bank statements, his theater reservations, all the information you need in the course of living in a complex modern society. This will be in a compact form in his own house. He'll have a television screen like these here and a keyboard, and he'll talk to the computer, get information from it, and he'll take it as much for granted as we take the telephone. I wonder, though, what sort of a life would it be like in social terms? I mean, if our whole life is built around the computer, do we become a computer-dependent society and computer-independent individuals? In some ways, but they will also enrich our society because it will make it possible for us to live really anywhere we like. Any businessman, any executive could live almost anywhere on Earth and still do his business through a device like this. And this is a wonderful thing. It means we want him to be stuck in cities, we better live out in, in the country or wherever we please and still carry on complete interaction with human beings as, as well as with other computers. Nothing says technology like solar cars. The world's first solar challenge was in 1987 from Darwin to Adelaide. The race has reached circus proportions today with scrutineering and public displays. The check mark and we've got to weigh it. We must weigh it. Around 20 international media crews have descended on officials and team members. The Solar Challenge is supposedly a race for all comers, from the super slick General Motors effort with its media lunches and official unveiling, to the efforts of young student engineers facing 3,000 kilometres to Adelaide with borrowed backup vehicles. Organisers say the sun will decide the winner but what about the checkbook? The garage entries are as important as the large companies. Um, all of us would like bigger budgets to do things. So um, I don't know the answer to, to that question, but the eight square metres stay, and everybody should have the chance to, to give benefit to everybody on Earth. In Darwin, the heat really is on. It's the last minute build up to the race and to the rainy season. The Met Bureau are forecasting 40 degree temperatures between here and Tennant Creek and crosswinds that could create problems for this style of car. The solar challenge begins under increasingly cloudy skies on Sunday at 9am. Now we have to show who won. It was the Sun Racer. And just have a look at how one cameraman was perched in a special chair in front of a car to get the best pictures. As the sun went down on the Sun Racer last night, the vehicle and its supporting entourage were camped 160 kilometres north of Adelaide. 
This morning it took the multi-million dollar Whisper Quiet machine only two hours to reach its destination and take out the World Solar Challenge Cup. After passing through the northern suburbs, the Sun Racer made its way through city streets to arrive at the Adelaide Oval, 3,200 kilometres and five and a half days from its starting point in Darwin. The car blitzed the field with only two of the other 20 vehicles currently south of Alice Springs. It was a quick stop at the Oval before going on to the finish line at Seppelsfield in the Barossa Valley, a victory for General Motors in particular and solar research. The whole uh, advent of the solar car and the Sun Racer was really, uh, could it be done? And your first impulse is to say, no, it didn't work. You can't have enough power from the sun to drive all the way from Darwin to Adelaide. Well, in fact, the great victory is that it, we could do that. And so can other cars do that. All that technology means nothing if you can't make it work. And that's where the people came in. And that's the other victory is the people did make it work. It may not seem like much now, but the Hills Hoist was cutting edge in its time. It was invented in 1946 and was incredibly popular. In 1946, Lance Hill invented the Hills Hoist. In the same year, he went into production with his brother-in-law, Harold Ling, and founded Hills Industries. The popularity of the Hills Hoist quickly spread around Australia. But what was it that inspired Lance Hill and Harold Ling's revolutionary idea for drying clothes? Mrs Hill really wanted to have a new clothes line and there was the question of uh, developing up a good product and Mr Hill and my father, Mr Ling, uh, used to go down to the bedding shop on a Saturday afternoon and uh, they discussed the, the subject of making clothes lines in that bedding shop, got together, formed a partnership and uh, began to make and sell the clothes line, the Hill's Hoist. <laughs> Today, most Australians own a Hills Hoist. Yes, I had. Yeah, still going good. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Have you? <laughs> I did have, but I miss it. I really miss it. Uh, I am a proud Hills Hoist owner. Well, I think it's um, so versatile. Well, I think they're very good because you can hang a lot of washing on them. You wanted the clothes to spin in the wind and dry more quickly. You wanted mum to stand in one place and get all those clothes hung up from the one place and not be racing up and down a long clothesline. It's been something that has helped reduce the burden, I guess, for the housewife and for the woman of the home. He told me to hang out the washing, so now it's ease up, ease up, easy, so easy with Hill. You're supposed to take the washing out of the machines first, Bev. <laughs> At the beginning of the show, we started with the first ATM. Getting your ATM card back, however, meant waiting for the post. These machines you'll be seeing before uh, too long, in about six weeks' time, actually, on the bank's walls around Sydney. And uh, all you do is just place this card in here, in the slot. It's taken inside. You wait for a light to come on and you press six digits. Wait a second or two and out drops your instant cash, $25 of it. It seems very simple and uh, very nice. But it's not quite as easy as all that. Uh, Ian Masters is the representative of the Chubb Company who are going to be uh, installing these um, machines for the commercial banking company. Uh, how does it actually work behind the wall, Ian? Well, the, the card, is, which you just place through the machine there, is specially computed with information containing the, the account number, branch number, etc. It is, when it is placed in the machine, it is necessary for the combination number to be tapped after the card has been accepted by the machine. And three, oh, five. As you can see, the whole operation, when you have the correct number, only takes about 10 seconds. Well, how's it going to work uh, from the bank's point of view? I mean, uh, how do you get the cards and who's going to get them? Well, any cheque account customer of the bank will be able to obtain one from his local 
bank manager. Well, once the card goes back in here into the machine, it disappears. It's not returned to the... How does the client, client get it back? Not immediately. The, the machine retains the card and then it is forwarded back to the client by the fastest possible means by the bank once the account has been debited. Um, it only pays $25? Only $25, yes. Well, what happens if somebody wants more than $25? Well, in that case, uh, I think it'd be best if they make arrangements with their local bank manager to overcome this. Another famous Australian technology is the black box flight recorder, an important tool in helping to understand aviation accidents. But Dr David Warren's invention wasn't initially identified as important and he was cross when America's Smithsonian didn't recognise the device's Australian roots. It has an American unit on show. It doesn't mention the country which, this country, which first made it mandatory. It doesn't mention um, uh, the uh, country that first flew one in the air, which is this one. It doesn't mention the push we had for 14 years to get the Americans even to recognise the value of it. Um, Dr David Warren lamenting about the failure of Washington Smithsonian Institute to recognise an Australian invention. And this is it the world's first flight recorder or black box, which he and his friends developed in the 1950s and 60s. Ironically, it was the failure of another world first, the first civilian jet called the Comet, that inspired the Warren idea. Warren wasn't an electronics specialist, but rather a fuels expert with the aeronautical research laboratories. He sat on a committee considering the Comet's problems. I kept thinking to myself, if it were a pilot error or if it were something which were known to the crew, they may have said something or done something. If only we could recapture those last few seconds, it would save all this argument and uncertainty. We'd know what it was. Somebody may have known. And I had been, just the week before, to an instrument exhibition and seen this. Now, this is the world's first pocket recorder, if you like, the Minifon, a German unit, which records on about two or three miles of very fine wire, as thick as your hair, Inspiration is one thing, but selling an idea is quite another. Our first effort was to try and get the Australian authorities on side, and so we wrote them a letter, and their reply was uh, to go and send us three pages of what was required then in aircraft, as if we weren't quite sure, uh, and then the statement, and so you see Dr Warren's invention has no immediate significance in civil aviation. Now, Eventually, it was the British and Americans who manufactured and refined what is now standard equipment on all commercial aircraft. And that's Retrospect. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.